Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the British Library. Um, unfortunately, our chair, Tony, is still unavailable, but we're going to start the conversation now uh, without him, and hopefully he'll be coming to join us any moment. Um, I'm Brett Walsh from the Cultural Events Department. It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to this little oasis we've created in the entrance hall of the British Library. We're going to be discussing the humble houseplant tonight, and we'd like you all to get involved by sending us your pictures of your um, beloved botanicals. So if you want to send a picture in, you can at us on the at events BL Twitter handle. And if you're watching us online, there's a form underneath the video where you can submit your pictures. We'll also be taking questions at the end of the event, so you can submit your questions there too. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I think we're going to hand over to Mike to begin with, who's going to do a short presentation on his book, The History of Houseplants. And um, Mike will also be doing a signing after the event. And then following that, we'll be going into a panel conversation, and um, then we'll take questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Right. Good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I'm sorry we've kept you waiting. Um, I came to house plants quite late. I was, um, my father was a professional horticulturist, and he regarded uh, house plants as a yeah, really not something that he could get into. My mother, on the other hand, had, had a few house plants, but I've worked a lot. I've worked in botanic gardens and in, with plant-related jobs, and I suddenly realized that there's amazing stories behind all these plants that we pick up at the garden center or we pick up um, at the railway station or wherever, or we, in fact, exchange with our friends or indeed perhaps even purloin cuttings when we're, we're out and about. I'm just looking to see if anyone twitched guiltily when I said that. Yes, there's one or two people I think have subconsciously admitted to stealing a cutting. Yes, thank you, Carlos. <laughs> no, botanic garden man. So, um, so I, I started realizing that you could tell the history of the evolution of science. You could tell the evolution of uh, design through house plants and how people have invited plants into their houses. And now we've got designers who are talking about multi-species clients. So it's not just the humans, it's the other living things that live in the house, whether it's our focus on plants now, but perhaps in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, it'll not only be house plants, it'll be house algae and house fungi. And we'll see that taxonomic spread of, of, of interest. So if we go back in history, We've always been bringing plants into our dwellings, whether it's to make the place smell better, to get rid of parasites, whether it's to bring them in as herbs, or as, as we approach Christmas, as decorations. But the bringing living plants into houses really, in the Western tradition, goes back to the 1700s. And at that point, there was a, an interesting convergence of more wealth, bigger houses, a little bit more glass, a um, little bit more dependable heating, and new plants were coming in. So during the 1600s, 1700s, you started to get an, in, an interest in plants. Could I have the next slide, please? So I'm going to go back to this honourable gentleman, Thomas Fairchild, and he was a London nurseryman, and he wrote The City Gardener, and that was one of the early books that said... It's great to bring plants into your house. They scent it, they decorate it. And so he really was one of the first people to start talking about house plants. With house plants, as we know it, it was Thomas Rochford that really came up with that idea in the mid 20th century. But the great thing about Thomas Fairchild is that he did the first recorded hybridization between two species. Um, and at, the, at that time, Species regard, were regarded as fixed and incorruptible as of the day of creation. And he had gone beyond where you should go and cross two species to make an artificial hybrid. And he really thought his soul was in immortal danger. And in his will, he asked that a sermon be read in the city of London each year, and it still is. 
And so he, an amazing man. And this was the time when the first exotics were coming in. You had the first Apuntias coming in from the Caribbean. You had the agaves coming in. You had the first bananas. Things were really exciting uh, for Fairchild. And that, that sort of tidal wave of plants just increased as you went into the 1800s and the 1900s. And of course, that was related to trade and just the sheer volume of shipping coming in and then the aggregation of wealth and people wanting to collect plants. And so really it was the 19th century that started people, ordinary folk, buying plants for their house and the key thing there was the Wardian case where you could put them inside, nice glazed box and protect them from the sooty uh, urban atmosphere. And then we had the sort of 1950s post-war boom again because central heating came in we had nurseries in this country like Thomas Rochford that were growing new house plants. Festival of Britain was promoting house plants, and there was wealth, and there was time for leisure. Could I have the next slide, please? This, to me, is the ultimate house plant. This is the African violet, St. Paulia, from the mountains of Tanzania, uh, the Usambara in particular. And I think it's, it's the ultimate house plant because it tells all the stories. It was a colonial collection. It was a German um, administrator in then German East Africa in the Usambara Mountains who sent a packet of seed back to his dad in Germany. And he then sent the seed to a botanic garden nearby. And that was then exhibited at a horticultural fair. The material seed was then sent to America. And it was in America that it became a focus of breeding. And my dad had, two, had a scale for whether a plant is a good plant. It was either an abomination or a bobby dazzler. And depending where your tastes are, the African violet spans that spectrum. There's some you look at and go, really, that's just not necessary. That should not be allowed. Um, <coughs> and so the Americans kick-started the African violets. And Eastern Europe adopted the African violet, so we always had a Soviet phase of development and breeding of the African violets. And if you go, I traveled in Russia um, in the 80s and 90s, and everywhere you went were African violets. Um, and today, the really pioneer breeders are in Ukraine and Russia and Japan. And in the 50s, there was a whole phase of breeding using radiation to get new varieties and you would have atomic enriched African violets with atomically enriched potting compost that you could buy. Heaven knows what that resulted in. So I'm a conservationist and I, I work on conservation. This to me is another story about house plants. Tens of millions of African violets on kitchen shelves, kitchen windows around the world. The wild African violets in the uh, coral rags of southern Kenya in the mountains of the Usambara in Tanzania on the verge of extinction. So you've got a po the wild population collapsing, and you've got this, the horticultural derivative, millions of dollars of trade each year and no benefit back to the wild. So next one, please. It's almost Christmas. You'll forgive me for putting a poinsettia in there. The other sort of official... To me, this is not a house plant. This is a rooted cutting that you buy, you kill, and you dispose of. Uh, very few of these last beyond February or March. And this, again, is a, it's a South American plant. It's a native of Mexico. It's a euphorbia. And it was named after Poinsett, who was an American diplomat who traveled through Mexico in the 19th century. And he collected material, sent it back to Philadelphia, and there were materials from that collection at the very first Philadelphia Flower Show in the 1860s, I think. Poinsett didn't discover it. It's an ancient sacred plant of the Aztecs, and virtually all the Spanish colonial botanists saw it. But Poinsett collected it at a time when it could be distributed and when it could be adopted by horticulture. And what we've done is we've converted a 15, 20-foot straggly tree into a compact plant where we use day length and hormones to shrink th the stem. We've selected for color, including what I regard as totally superfluous white varieties, but that's a personal <laughs> taste. Um, and all that breeding has been done in California and the Netherlands. 
what is really interesting now is the Mexicans have gone back, they're looking at their native plants, and there's a whole new school of poinsettia breeders in Mexico developing Mexican varieties. And it's in, in parts of Mexico, there's a, there's a phrase, um, poinsettismo, which means American bragging, and it's named after poinsett. So finally, the grudge is being settled. The Mexicans are now taking back their plant and growing new varieties for sale in Mexico City. So my thesis is house plants are terrific fun. Um, house plants are good therapy. They will not clear your flat of pollutants. Um, but they're a joy, and there's a story behind each one of them that is a real surprise. And I think in these days where we're living in increasingly crowded urban places, we need those bits of green, and we need those links back to the wild and back to other cultures. So that's my love of houseplants. Thanks very much. Yep. <clears throat> And you've got the two real experts sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was really fascinating. And I, I read something in one of the papers in the last couple of days, uh, a bit of a poinsettia scare story, oh, no. uh, saying, I can't remember exactly what the headline was, but it was something along the lines of, this plant could make your hair fall out, uh. which I thought was really quite, you know, scaremongering. Of course, as you say, poinsettia is a, f or euphorbia, yeah common to that genus is that milky sap which if you've ever had an encounter with a garden euphorbia you may have experienced skin uh, irritation as a result of that. Um, I did sort of dig around and found out I think there have been traditional medicinal uses of mm, poinsettia right. and one of them which I did, didn't know about in Mexico was as a depilatory as a hair remover and so I guess that's the basis of this idea that you might I don't know. You'd have to rub it on your whole head. I don't know how it, it would and work. It off. But oh no! no. <laughs> it, it did fascinate me that uh, people were being um, urged not to grow this plant on the basis that it might you might lose your hair. I mean, you do have to be careful with obviously nibbling pets um, and indeed small children uh, with any euphorbia. But I uh, never <laughs> nibble my pets. No, no. indeed. Um, and I think. A lot of it, that surprises people to know that many of the house plants that we grow uh, are not something that you want to put in your mouth, really. I mean, mm. there are some ones that are eaten, a few, but not many. Don't eat them. <laughs> no, it's, it's quite an interesting topic because we get it all the time, no? The, the plant is poisonous, you should not have it because it's dangerous, but the reality is that most plants are not trying to, to kill you. Basically, if you choose on euphorbia, probably it will taste horrible and you will just spit it out. So even though it's toxic, it's not, I touch it and I die, you know, mm. like, and in fact, there is very few cases of intoxications. Perhaps the best example is the English yew, yes. which is absolutely poisonous, and yet pretty much you never hear of somebody dying of it, because to ingest it, you will have to probably process it somehow. If you put that in your mouth, it's terrible. So I, I, I tend to be more worried about physical damage, like things like agaves, which have big thorns and maybe mm -hmm. can poke your mm. eye or things like this, and toxic plants for some reason. Yeah. There's a, the different back here, the dumb cane that many of us grow as a, as a house plant is, a, is, a, is an example of a, a very storied plant around its, its poisons. So um, it's originally from the rainforests of South America and the Caribbean. Um, the Amerindian people used it as a poison for arrows to tip uh, arrows when hunting. Then during the, uh, the brutal plantation era in the Caribbean, it was used to punish enslaved people, hence the name dumb cane, because it caused a swelling of the mouth and the tongue, and I, it was horrible. And then during the Second World War, uh, the Nazis experimented with it as a, as a poison. Yet, when you visit households in the Amazon basin, it's grown on every veranda as a plant yeah. to keep evil away. And so it's, it, it's an incredibly storied plant, a very beautiful plant where there's whole, uh, you know, research team at the University of Florida breeding new varieties. Yet it's got these um, both sinister and benign characteristics wrapped into its identity. And that to me is part of the fun of house plants. They, they carry 
they carry legends, they carry um, stories with them. Uh, but that is one I really would recommend you don't, don't chew. I always find the Diefenbecher just not very easy to grow. I'd rather have an Aglionema, which is another uh, aroid from a different part of the world, from Southeast Asia, which I think is, is more tol I find that more tolerant of uh, uh, house conditions uh, and a bit less prone to turning into uh, a stick. <laughs> Stick with yellow leaves. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it perhaps it's just me, but I, I find the the Diefenbaker it doesn't like my house at all. Um, but yeah, the Aglionema seems to be a more more uh, more adaptable to household conditions. But you're right, it's a huge. The 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 dumb cane is just a massive, massive. I don't know what the production's like in in Florida now, but. Over the decades, it has been just oh, one of the premier houseplants, hasn't it? Yes, uh, and it really is, uh, and in the Netherlands, produced, and it propagates very easily from cuttings, so mm, it's, it's mm. you can produce it. it. It's very intolerant of cold drafts in the winter, I think, is oh. part of the problem. <laughs> and, um, doesn't like my house, then. <laughs> and, and I really wonder whether over the next five, ten years, we're going to see a shift in the plants we want to grow in our houses as we look at more cold-tolerant house plants frankly and we go back to those old favorites like um Cissus right. antarctica the kangaroo vine or um even the little white fly magnet solanum the, the, you know the winter cherry pseudo capsicastrum that's the one thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's an interesting yeah and i think also i mean i'm hoping people are going to fall back in love with things like uh, well a couple of members of the saxophage family which are kind of out of favor i mean i did a whole chapter on one of them in my book just because I wanted people to grow them again. So the strawberry saxophage and the piggyback plant, mm. Olmea menziesii, which are very cold tolerant, and I love both of those, um, and they do really well in... in so if, you, yeah, if you're looking for a sort of a fuel crisis houseplant... And of course, Aspidistra, we haven't mentioned yes, that either. But, but then, of course, we have to remember that last summer we got 41 degrees. True. True. So yeah. it's quite interesting how we tend to react to to the weather apocalypse of the moment, isn't it? Now winter is coming, the yes. temperature has to be dropped because energy is expensive, but then there is the problems with water, there is the problems with heat, mm. which so maybe I wonder if we should ask a question on what is a good house plant, isn't it? And what it is not. So is it good because it survives on neglect or is it good because it responds to love? Yeah, I think it's good when they tolerate neglect, really, because we all have this kind of crazy life, traveling, and uh, at some point you will have to leave your plant alone for a few days. The St. Paulia is a very mm. good example. We grow it in Kew Gardens, and we kill St. Paulias in a weekly basis. And this is because we check them every day. And then you have a hose, and then triggering the hose and water, and it happens very often. And it's a plant that really needs you to forget about it and maybe just remem remember them just once a week at the very yeah. most, isn't it? So we tend to overwater over in them just out of too much care, if yeah. that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. In the wild, the African violets often grow in little limestone cliffs in the forest, um, very much you know, as lithophytes, so, that, so they're not really in deep soil and we tend to grow them in the pots with quite deep soil. And some of them will go seasonally dormant, the leaves will just go little crispy and they'll sit there and waiting for the wet season after two or three months. Uh, in fact, they sh some of them share a, a habitat with that wonderful thing at the end there, the Zamia kulkas, or ZZ or ZZ, depending where you're from, um, which is always touted as the world's most indestructible houseplant. Hmm. Um, and it probably is, but that yes. goes, that lives in dry bushland and will have quite a bit of moisture for six months and then go totally dry for six months. Yes. I, w I don't know the answer to this, but I'm wondering whether the ratio of epiphytes and lithophytes, so plants that live on other plants, mainly trees, and plants that live on rocks, compared to terrestrial plants, the, the ratio in the houseplant world is much more tipped in favor of the epiphytes yeah. than, I mean, I don't know, in nature, what proportion do the epiphytes and lithophytes make up of the... Mm. Because there are so many houseplants that are epiphytes, and sometimes we don't really realise that, or we, it's not something we possibly know about, but it, it's a lot of houseplants, isn't it? Mm. So when you start looking. It's interesting, because most epiphytes, they tend to 
be able to handle dry periods because they are up in a branch where there is a lot of wind. Yeah. Yes, direct sun. Uh, direct sun. Usually there is not a lot of light because they are generally growing in a tree, so that saves them. And I, I realized the other day that, for example, one habitat that makes amazing house plants is plants that grow in entrances of caves. Because at the end of the day, your window is just like an entrance of a cave. Mm. So the light comes only from one side, then in a cave you are sheltered from the wind, like your house is, and, and then things like that peperomia, yes. and things like this, they, that is a very good spot to find good house plants. And that really is the key, isn't it, to, yeah. to success, is kind of understanding how your house plant grows in the wild and then thinking about how you can try as best you can in your, you know, three-bed semi. Well, I live in a three-bed semi anyway. <laughs> you can try to replicate those conditions. So the one of the plants that I think I get the most questions about on my podcast is the string of pearls, Curio rolianus previously Senecio mm. mm. Rolianus. And that plant, it just so often I get sent a photo of somebody's plant and it's kind of mushy and it's a, just a terrible mess that's kind of just rotted down and people sort of say, well, how, why has this happened? And, you know, when you look at how that plant grows in the wild, uh, it grows not as a string, but as a mat. We should be calling it mat of pearls, which <laughs> I guess that doesn't sound so good. But, you know, the, the, the string of pearls grows as a mat, and those little wiry stems are rooting into little tiny pockets of soil uh, on a rocky environment. And therefore, it doesn't really want to be in a plastic pot, in highly moisture-retentive, mm substrate that you tend to have that's how you tend to buy it from the you know when you buy it that's what it's sold in in a plastic plot which doesn't in a plastic pot which doesn't allow any drainage um it doesn't allow any evaporation of moisture sometimes even in peat yeah uh, so you've got all these issues already stacking up from the start and unless you know okay maybe this needs a different kind of substrate unless you know to repot it into something much more free draining and to maybe give it a shallow pot and uh, so on, then you're sort of setting yourself up from, for failure from the beginning, um, <laughs> which, is, which is why you know, it applies to all, every house plant you grow. If you do a little bit of uh, digging, avoid the pun, I think you can find out useful, pertinent information. I mean, again, any succulent, you know, if it's, it's going to be in a dark room, north-facing small window, it's probably not going to be very happy, <laughs> ultimately, because those plants are just designed for high light, aren't they? Yeah, that's another problem that we tend to see, not so much people which is really into house plants, but the general public, they tend to see the plants like a decoration object. So this plant looks fantastic there, but in fact, this will be around here, and in there you should put that one. It's a message like finding the right plant for the right spot, yes. And yet a plant that you like is difficult some, somehow, especially I found here in the UK, the angle of the sun fluctuates so much from summer to the winter that I, I don't feel confident with leaving a plant in a single spot ever. I have you to be it. always mm, yeah. working in summer, every winter, and this is not what you want if you want to have a kind of IKEA house in which everything is perfectly set, isn't it? Um, then I guess that this has become a bit worse now with the coming of social media because you put pictures of plants out of context. So maybe they are growing this plant inside a terrarium with LED lights in high humidity, and then just for the picture, they put it there in the living room. My favorite is when, for example, you see a picture of a living room and every look, everything looks amazing, and they have all these plants, and you wonder yourself why in this house no single leaf is facing the window, they are facing the camera. So mm -hmm. this is because somebody has been yeah. you know, <laughs> sitting in there and then sometimes happens this thing of if you have a monster at this big, it will block the light and then no more light, no more plants will be able to thrive in there, but then they have it somewhere else. So then we all try to strive to get this perfect idea of a lifestyle with a jungle in the living room and sometimes it's possible, yeah. but sometimes it's not. Depends on the tolerance of your family. <laughs> it does, that's true. <laughs> Very um, true. Yeah. And I think, I think light is really, people sort of say, oh, you know, the majority of house plants are killed by overwatering, but light really, I mean, all of these things are kind of connected. It's a bit like a kind of a puppet on a string. Light, water, nutrients, mm. temperature, 
relative humility are all connected together and they're all kind of working in tandem. And if you, but if you don't have the right light, you really are in trouble. And most of the time, I think most of the time it's, it's not enough light. People are underestimating yeah, yes. the amount of light in there. Um, overestimating rather the amount of light. I got given a, a grow light last year for, my, for Christmas and I've got a small set of house plants underneath it and I've got my new favorite house plant that is just thriving underneath this artificial light and it's a, it's a purple leaf thing called Gynura. Yeah. And I'd had it before and it just looked as miserable as sin. <laughs> and now I've got the supplementary light on and it's thriving and the purple is accentuated. Uh, so if you really want that sort of textual plant with an interesting leaf color, Gynura is one I, I'd recommend, but it really does need that little bit of supplementary light, particularly in the winter, just to, to get it through. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hooked on, the, on those lights now. They do make a difference. And I, it's interesting how a lot of that technology has fed through from uh, the Aquarium. world of cannabis, cannabis growers. <laughs> yeah, ca cannabis growers. <laughs> developed a lot of the technology of hydroponics and LED grow lights and well before LED as well that has now kind of come through into the houseplant business it which is, is fascinating. Absolutely right. Um, yes. And uh, yeah there's been it's quite separate worlds in one respect but also that technology has been adopted and uh, yeah it's yep. helped a lot of people with their houseplants I suspect. But you also write aquariums. Exactly yeah, yeah I was going to say this yeah. because then we you know the there is this um, them alternative movement, which is aquariums, which in everybody's head is fish tanks, but then the reality is many people grow, for example, aquatic plants, or they grow even corals, and then that has facilitated companies making much compact units, which are much smaller and pleasing on the eye, easy to install, you can control all the parameters, then people from the house plant, they start then putting them in these things and then enter the terrarium thing, which then that enables you to have humidity control because it's enclosed. Yeah. The light is can be regulated. You can even inject CO2 to increase them. And then you can have a box like this big and have maybe a hundred species of small begonias and yes. mm. and then enables you to have it out of the window, out of the toilet for the humidity, and then you have the plants where you want them. And I've, I've seen some lovely versions of these called, they call them paludarians. paludarians yeah. And things that we know as aquarium plants, like the cryptocrines and the Anubias and the Echinodorus, grow very well with just a couple of inches of water in the supplementary light, because they flower yes. um, when they've got shallower water. And the leaf colors on some of them, the Anubias, are Yes. Fantastic. So and you, you, can, you can spend an awful lot of money very quickly on these paludaria, but they are pretty impressive. And it also allows you to maybe have some shrimps in the water and some frogs on the bromeliads, and then before you blink, this you have This is how it starts, people. This is how yeah, it this starts. Is, yes. You know, with an <laughs> ecosystem in a box, it, you know. You have no money. <laughs> and, and I guess that it all ties down into something which I call biophilia, isn't it? If it's, if it's alive, I like it. Yes. And, and then, you know, and for example, it's also the issue that you mentioned before of your partner saying, oh my God, all these plants, well, they are now in a box, you know, <laughs> like they are there and then they don't escape. So you are the ruler of that box. And, and then you can, you can really play with everything, you know, with the light, the humidity, the fertilizers. Frogs would cause me problems. I think I'd be kicked out of the house. <laughs> yeah, especially frogs. when they start making noise at night, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting with the sort of the way that social media has framed, literally framed the houseplant world in the yes. last few years. And I do have this theory that, I mean, I love flowering houseplants. I'm probably a very small minority, um, but I love flowering houseplants. And I think the reason why leafy houseplants have become more popular than flowering houseplants, maybe you have other theories, chaps, but my theory is that it looks really good to have a leaf in a square. It, you can, you somehow it's easier to photograph a, a beautiful leaf in the Instagram square mm. than it is a gar Have you ever tried taking pictures of your garden and putting it on Instagram? Yeah, it's really hard. Yes. Um, and flowers as well don't look 
so something about the composition doesn't work. And I wonder if it's something as basic as that. I mean, I'm constantly trying to champion people to grow more flowering house plants. And I did see a story saying, you know, next year's trend is flowering house plants. Oh, yeah. Heard it here first. Um, but <laughs> I, yeah, I think that has framed a lot. And people now have this expectation, and indeed it is the reality that they can go and f see a plant on Instagram and click, 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 they've ordered it and it's coming to them. Mm. You know, uh, whereas in the past, obviously it was a bit more torturous and yes. one had to, you know, send off a stamped addressed envelope and all that kind of thing. But it, there's an immediacy now, which can have its benefits, but I think also is quite dangerous because um, there's a, an aspect of not buying a plant without necessarily doing that research I was talking yeah. about earlier yeah. and, and, and figuring out how to look after Paying some it. extraordinary prices. Well, indeed, we're, yeah. We're seeing some um, aeroids, and it, aeroids do, you know, the aeroids, the monsters, the colocases, and all, they, they seem to generate a particular type of fanaticism. Yes. Um, and so we're, we're getting these stories of leaf sports of monstera at $700 or $2,000, yes. and people buying them as an investment. So we're on the verge of the tulip crash with houseplants at the moment, which I... You know, we, we learnt our lesson, I think. The yeah. Dutch did a few hundred years ago on that. But I was giggling the other day, looking at, um, apparently, in the Victorian times, having a pineapple was a symbol of wealth. So people will go walking with a pineapple in the street so that everybody <laughs> could see that they have a pineapple, they will paint themselves. And this is what is happening now. You, with could, you could rent them for din dinner parties. You isn't it? Yeah, you could yeah. And then give it back the next day. And this is almost what is happening with the Monstera, isn't it? Like, you can now put a picture of yourself in Instagram with this super expensive item, which gives you and a position of a status, isn't it? And we've really been here before with houseplants, too. I mean, the Kentia palm was the same. You know, you could yeah. rent a Kentia palm. Or if you didn't have enough money to have a whole Kentia palm, you would buy a couple of fronds for your dinner table scene so you could at least have the sense that you had enough to have a couple of fronds of the Kenji farm as opposed to having a whole plant and people used to have that plant and because their homes were quite dark and uh, gloomy um, they used to send them on holiday to nurseries for a couple of months a year uh, and they were hugely expensive absolutely mm. cost a huge amount of money um, but they were a, a sign of you've made it you've got one of these this is you've really uh, made, had achieved achieved something and of course yes. that was the palm that the palm court uh, was embodied by the the kentia palm they were so on the titanic yeah and they were on the <laughs> titanic yeah um so you know it's a sort of a global symbol so we have kind of been here before with mm. house plants and i think you know like everything in li in life it's cyclical i mm. wonder back to you know whether you know i don't know in medieval times whether it was like oh the new trendy herb is rue and everyone's bringing yeah. rue into i don't know what what the um trendy plant of the of that far back was but it, it has happened over and over again i, hasn't I can it? imagine there would be trendy herbs but there's stuff that we're now approaching which is completely new and I, I, one of the things that intrigues me is, is, the, is the science of breeding and developing new house plants. So hybridization was the big thing in the 18th and 19th centuries. That was the revolutionary, potentially sacrilegious thing to do. Now we're um, entering an age of, of genetic modification, and there's just been a, a patent taken out on a modified skin dapsus uh, that has been altered to absorb um, toxic fumes more effectively than the natural skin dapsus. So do we accept genetically modified house plants in our house or not? And then you've got groups at MIT, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that are blending robots and plants. So you've, um, it sounds absolutely horrendous. They've got, they've got these little um, containerized plants on a, basically what looks like a Meccano wheelbase. And they, you can read, there's, there's sensors to, for, for moisture. And if it gets dry, they will send you a text message. Uh, so your plants are calling you. Uh, you know, just when we didn't, we got used to them as passive. Now they're going to be texting us saying, feed us, water us. <laughs> or what, what some of the other guys there have done is program them to converge on water fountains to signal to be watered by the people having a <laughs> cup of water. So you're getting this um, hybridization between plants and robotics, and you're getting a sort of hybridization between plant structures and architectural structures. So it's impossible to know where the planting stops and the building starts. 
So I think there's some really interesting new areas that we're getting into um, that I think are going to be really fascinating and will test our relationship with, with plants. I think the whole genetic modification thing will be one of those. But I know that if you know, the great plant breeders of the 19th century had access to glow-in-the-dark plants, which someone, people are breeding, they would have just snapped that up and we'd have had you know, <laughs> glow-in-the-dark monkey puzzle trees in every Victorian cemetery in the country. You know, those, what a wonderful image. It's interesting, in the, going back to the Aquarian thing, in the US industry, they have glow-in-the-dark fish. Yes, that's right, the yes. Fish, and they are totally banned in Europe because the regulations on yeah. genetically modified organisms. And we haven't mentioned tissue culture, but we should, of course, mention that because that really has made, reshaped the houseplant industry in that things like um, Nepenthes, the tropical picture plants, which, you know, even like 20 years ago, really, you probably wouldn't be growing that if you were a normal kind of person. You, you, you just wouldn't be able to afford it. Whereas now, normal. Nepenthes, well, you know, a person who, who <laughs> didn't have a specialist setup, if I can put it that way, yeah. uh, who didn't have a, a, a huge budget, whereas now you can walk into any, pretty any much, any garden centre and pick up uh, and Nepenthes, and that's because of tissue culture, where labs are producing huge amounts of plants in that way, and same for the aroids, I think, as well. Yeah. And, the, and the orchids. So if you look at the price of a Phalaenopsis, the moth orchid, the white, beautiful white orchid that we buy as a house plant, that was, 40 years ago, a real connoisseur's serious investment. Now it's cheaper than cut flowers. Yes. And that's because of the selective breeding, the tissue culture, working out how to raise orchids um, in vitro, and then tracking cheap production. So the, a lot of the production of houseplants tracks cheap labor, cheap sun, and is not really sustainable. So I lived for a number of years in Florida. And there were vast nurseries growing houseplants there because you don't pay for the heating and the labor's cheap. And so now houseplants that you might buy here may have been propagated in Miami, may have been propagated in Thailand, um, may have been grown on a bit in the Netherlands, uh, and they've been finished off in the nursery over here. So there's that huge global trade of moving pot plants, house plants around. So do ask where this has come from and see whether there's a way of, and I know some companies are trying to get more homegrown, UK grown pot plants because of the carbon cost of shipping these things all around the world. Yeah, it, it's, it's an issue that, you know, I've talked about my podcast a lot. And one of the things I always try to champion is, well, one of the things you can do also is be nosy. Like if you've got neighbors who live in the same kind of house that you do, who happen to have some plants, look at what grows well in their house. And nick a bit. And then, uh, yeah, <laughs> and then ask them for some cut, knock on the door and say, you've got that lovely begonia in your window. I'm just wondering if I can have a cutting. And most of the time people say yes. And so there's a wonderful, I mean, a lot of my house plants come from uh, those kind of swaps and um, those uh, growing from seed and some other ways of growing doesn't have to necessarily involve uh, financial transactions. No. And it's also a really great way to learn about mm -hmm. houseplants by growing something from a cutting or from seed. You just, you might go wrong, but you do learn a lot. And then going <laughs> back to what you were saying about then each species has a history, then you do your own history with this plant. Because yes. what it in Edinburgh when you went to see the neighbor of your uncle, and then it becomes a bit special, no? Yes, because you raise it from the beginning and there is a link to somebody on to some trip or to some... Yes, I remember some, someone describing their house plants as saying they lasted longer than, than my spouse did. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got multi-generational house plants that move, <laughs> move down the generation. So in my family, there's clivias that have gone and been yeah. split into various members of the family. So we've all got the same clivia variety scattered. Uh, and aspidistras, I mean, that's the other classic one. I often hear from people who say, oh, yes, this aspidistra has been in the family for over 100 years, and my siblings and I have got uh, divisions of it. And uh, I mean, really, that is, it's coming back into fashion now, actually, the aspidistra, mm. I think. It, uh, it is one, a quintessential houseplant. I mean, going back to your point, Carlos, about temperature differentials. Mm. Now, that is one plant that can cope with, with the cold, zero, yeah. but also high temperatures. So yeah. that, in yeah. a way, makes it a really great house plant. Um, mm. And yeah, just so enduring. 
uh, it just can take all the neglect. I guess the modern equivalent is the, the Zamiococcus, which, as you said, is just super tough. You know, in the wild, I think their technique for dealing with drought is just that they drop those leaflets, but then those leaflets can, if there is enough water, then reproduce. So um, th they're an incredible plant. I think they're the. I think I'm right in saying they're the only aroid. They're a member of the um, they aroid, aroid family. Yes. They're the only non-aquatic aroid that does something called CAM. I, I always have to mention this in talks. Crassulate. Crassulation acid metabolism. You can just throw there that into are. a conversation. Great dinner party. <laughs> um, so it's a kind of a form of photosynthesis that plants which need to um, cope with dry, hot conditions mm. use. And um, Zamiococcus does that particular form of photosynthesis where it opens its breathing um, holes, its stomata at night time and uh, does things differently to other plants. So again, yeah, they're just, it's a, that's why it's a really good plant. I think you could kill it by drowning it. I think you could, yes. yeah. that's probably the only way if you, s if you had it sitting in water for a really long time, but uh, it's, it's very durable. And there's a nice purple leaf variety. Is it raven that's yes. around at the moment? That's a very it's pretty. Black. Yeah, that's that, that's a lovely thing. Yeah, there's a few. Uh, there's a, I think there's a cream, as ever with everything, there's a cream variegated version Ooh. that starts starting to come as well. I knew you were going to... Two, two, <laughs> two um, people who weren't going to appreciate variegation, which is a controversial issue in the yes. world of houseplants, but... Yes. You either love it or... I'm, I'm unusual. I'm on the fence, really, with variegation. That is, that I can cope with some, but not others. Mm. That variegation topic is quite interesting because that uh, Monstera variegata is decades old, isn't it? It's a super old plant. In Kew Gardens, we have a whole wall of them. Yeah. And then, you know, we are a botanic garden. We should grow variegated plants. So then they chuck it, and we put, like, 26,000 kilometers of it on the container on the bin. And, like, two months later, then you start seeing them in Instagram for 300 pounds. But before, oh. probably, yeah. if we would have throw it in the garden, nobody would have bothered because it's a body related plant. You know, it's yes. like it, it becomes what it becomes the, the thing is a very difficult thing to, to measure or to predict, isn't it? it I, I, we're always looking for the new and the exotic when we, if you're a houseplant yeah. collector or houseplant nut, and you're always looking for that next great plant that's mm -hmm. going to give you some pleasure and give you a little bit of bragging rights, yes. and give you the, the trading ability to go out and do some swaps. That's, that's, the, that's yes. the fun bit, where there you can propagate stuff and say, right, can I do a swapsy? Um, there is an element, too, of you tend to want whatever you cannot have. You know, because if you really want a sameculcas or a spider plant, your, your crave is going to last 10 minutes because you go to the local Tesco in the corner and then you get it. And then that's it. You don't want it anymore <laughs> because you have it. You know, but when you, yeah. you can't really have it, you know? So the worst thing that they can tell you with a plant is that you cannot have it. Automatically, we all get like, why? Mm. No, and then you need, to, you need to have it because I can't or, or because it's difficult to grow rather than because yeah. it's easy to grow. But that's is exploring the darker psyche of plant collecting, <laughs> you know, the, the sort of gothic side of denial. <laughs> dun, 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 that's dun. why it's really interesting to, to, to yeah. dig and delve into the history of plants, because what, even with something like the humble spider plant, when you actually look into its history and how it grows, it is interesting. I mean, you may sort of, we, we, I think we're very sort of blasé about certain house plants and we just sort of, they're just there and they're in our office or whatever. But w if you actually dig deep, all plants are fascinating. There's, yeah. They're all doing incredible things and they are in got incredible adaptations for their uh, conditions. And so I think that's one thing I would always say is rather than, it's always very tempting to be like, oh, I've, I've got to get my next one. But it's really useful to kind of step back and say, maybe I just need to really appreciate the ones I've got Never. and learn more about them. Ooh. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to preach this to myself as much as anything else, but... Um, as, oh, I'm always looking for that next amaryllis, <laughs> you know, the hippiastrum, because they're, they're just great house plants and they flower and there's always new varieties coming out and... Um, yeah, I, I've got lack of willpower there. But I, ha I, I mean, applaud you. on, on yeah. the poinsettia, though, I do, uh, it's, uh, going back to that plant, when I, my, if I could get out one message, it would be, don't buy a poinsettia at Christmas. Buy instead something like, talking about epiphytes, a Christmas or Thanksgiving cactus, mm, which yes. will 
give you years, if you look after it, years and years and years of amazing blooms and become, become an heirloom plant. Whereas the poinsettia, and whenever we talk about, I think any anytime you talk about poinsettia, there'll be somebody on social media who will say, well, my poinsettia has been going for 20 years and it's great. And But most of us can't do that because it's, as, as we've already heard from Mike, it's a plant that just needs, big. Yeah, it's big and it needs day length to be mm. tr triggered, yes. yeah. well, the right day length to trigger the colour, the bracts, the colourful bracts. But a Christmas cactus is just a brilliant plant. Yeah. I can't yeah. speak of highly enough of that plant. That's Lovely right. cultivars. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, a, a, another example of an incredible history of this plant that started to be collected from South America in the um, early 1800s and just all this hybridisation that occurred um, and the result today is this amazing sort of fruit salad of colours and shapes. It's quite interesting too, because it's not very often said, but with the poinsettia, apart of the fact that it's not a very good house plant, because it's more a conservatory plant, mm. a place where you have sun, uh, light coming from different angles, maybe perhaps on the root, where the temperatures drop a little bit at night. There is this thing which is quite clear to me, it is plants like, for example, marantas and uh, even poinsettia. There is this birigamia in Sydney, this uh, uh, they call them Hawaiian palm. Oh, the brick, brick hammer, yes. Yeah. And when you get them from the flower shop, invariably, they tend to die. And if you manage to get one going for a longer time, then the propagules from this one grow with no problem. And I believe it's because they are forced and spoiled to that degree, basically they happen in a glass house in which the light is controlled to the last photon, the humidity to the fertilizer is coming to ten every day, the water is a raw water which doesn't have any salts. Everything is controlled in there. They even put hormones so that it becomes compact. And from that life of absolutely total spoil, it goes into a conveyor belt, it gets locked in the dark into a warehouse in the Netherlands, takes two days to be sold to the distributor, which put them then in an airport, and then they get flocked to Europe, and then they, you know, and then by the time it gets to you, this plant is just yeah. like looking nice, but internally has a confusion that, I mean, it's totally lost. And then what you do is you put it on the top of a radiator, boom, and then dehydrate it, and then automatically sets all the leaves, and they have like a crisis, you know, you have to restart it somehow. Yeah. And so, sometimes I found, even at Kiwi, when we get it from a commercial source, that you need to kind of treat it like a cutting, repropagate it and regrow this thing, mm. because otherwise it collapses. A very good example is Marantas in social media. I, I always see how everybody says, they are so difficult, oh my God. <laughs> Not at all, you know, I, I have tons in Kew Gardens and basically if you don't overwater it, then they are happy. But then you get it from the flower shop, yeah. doesn't matter what you do, it has a moment of collapse and hopefully regrow again. Hi, hi everyone. Um, sorry, so we haven't heard from Tony, so I think <laughs> we're going to... Um, oh no. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think he may not be able to make it, unfortunately. But we've had loads of images sent in mm. from people, so I thought it might be quite nice to have a look at that, and we could have some reactions. Is this um, sort of rate my plant? Are we going to have yes. to come up, yeah. give marks out of ten? Yes. So if we can have the first <laughs> slide, please. No pressure. I wonder if I should... Oh, so this that. sort of brings me to a question I was having. A lot of these images, people have given them human names. <laughs> and I wondered if the panel had a thought as to why yeah. maybe that is. I mean, we always oh, tend to amplify things. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I don't do that. My, my daughter has recently got into plants, and, and so has my son, and they uh, give their plants names. Uh, I've never done it, apart from sort of slightly sweary names for plants that are tricky. Uh, <laughs> but it is something that I think a lot of people like to do, and I think it's great if it makes you pay more attention to your plant. Like the main thing about looking after a plant is observation. Like, are you looking, really looking, yes. not just, you know, glancing at it, but actually really mm. looking at your plant. And that's how you learn about it, learn its habits. And so if giving it a name, I mean, I love the fact this one's called Triphony. That's amazing. Well done, Alex. Um, I think that's that's a that's a great and thing. And it's looking pretty good. It's looking great. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no brown tips on that. It's, no. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's just come out of the nursery or whether it's a long-standing. Well, from my side, I just will say that that is what we do in Kew Gardens, giving plants name all the time. You, you do. Know, that's that's very un I mean, very unscientific. No, it is not. It's a scientific name. You know, just keeping up with the changes on taxonomy. Oh, oh yes. Right. Yeah. Is that a Maranda or is that a I, I yeah. am not sure. 
that is... Y también significa usted, taxonomía has changed. Well, that's very true. That is very true. Oh, and people, people are very offended by the fact that oh, snake are. plants are now Dracaena. But this is uh, Alex again. So we've got the Zamia culcas, we've got there. Nice little terrarium. And, and I guess that's a pilea of some sort, I'm guessing. That is yes. pilea peperomioides. Yeah. Peperomioides, yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm going to have to have a, lo a little word with Alex about the cactus in a terrarium. Hmm. No, Alex, don't do that to yourself. <laughs> Really, um. no. I, I mean, I, I know it's very popular, but if you want to set yourself up su for success with a terrarium, don't put a cactus into it. Unless you can't get into it. Can <laughs> <you>? <laughs> Unless you put the light. But and we should also say, sorry, that we can also take questions from the audience yes, and questions great. online. So do be thinking of your questions if you have any. Uh, let's keep going through. Here's oh. another one. Mom. I mean, Tradescantia are a brilliant plant family for houseplants. Mm, yes prolific. I think one of the, f the factors that's common to so many house plants is they're easy to reproduce. So this is one of these plants that's handed around, cuttings are handed around, and you can literally, I mean, if you can't root a Tradescantia cutting, then yes. yeah. um, time you're, to go home. it's yeah. time to yeah. give up. <laughs> so, a br but it's a brilliant plant. And this one's obviously come from a family member. So yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. looking great. And it's best if you do, so with so many house plants, it's best if you do take lots of cuttings because that helps the plant stay more compact. Mm. That, that's clearly a very good houseplant species, isn't it? I like plum. That's the other <laughs> nice thing as well, the amount of people who've been saying stories of intergenerational or they've kind yes. of inherited the plant. So there's mm -hmm. this really nice connection through the generations, which is really nice. And sometimes you get particular plants tracking particular communities. So in Miami, the Cuban diaspora grow um, a certain set of house plants that remind them of home. Right. So mm. Amazing. This is a good one. Somebody's money tree, is it? A money plant, yeah, from What's the grandfather. Cal yeah, Calanchoe, yeah. No, Portulaga, no? And then no, not Calanchoe, what am I talking about? Crassula. Crassula. Crassula, yeah. Crassula, yeah. I mean, yeah. this is a really interesting plant because it has, you know, global... It, it really is a global house plant in that it's uh, ascribed lots of different meanings in different parts of the world. And uh, I did read something, it's very popular with feng shui practitioners. I did read an American <laughs> feng shui practitioner who said that you should put a $50 note under your money plant and it would kind of literally, I don't know how quite how this worked, but somehow that would bring you more money. Um, <laughs> at your own peril, try it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it, you just might lose the $50, but. Yeah, or maybe you just find the 50 pounds later on. Yeah, and exactly. And then you feel happy. Yeah. Nice, yeah. So that's well, a really that's nice story. Yes. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> another look cactus. That. that looks like a mammalaria, I would say. It's a mammalaria, yeah. 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 I mean, I do think cacti are wonderful house plants, and sometimes people do say, um, this hasn't grown for the past f 10 years, and then you look at it and you go, that's because it's dead, because you haven't <laughs> watered it. You do need to water cacti. I think that's something yeah, people yeah. get wrong, but I love that pot. And hopefully there's some drainage in there that allows that to not get waterlogged, because that's the other mm. thing. You, you dry them off in the winter, and then they go into active growth in the spring and the summer, but they still can't be waterlogged. But I am just hoping that he put it next to the books to make a link with the British Library, because <laughs> otherwise it will be as close as you can uh, to the window. To the sun. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And rot is an issue, isn't it, with cactuses? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to... They can rot very easily. Oh, oh, oh hang, hang on. Too far. Right. And we've got Yolanda the Yucca. A nice bit of alliteration there in the name. Yes. That's a really nice jungle corner. Yeah, nice by the window, getting lots of light coming through. Yeah, distance from the radiator. Yeah. And this is kind of implicit, but what about well-being? Obviously, they bring us a lot of joy. People have personal connections, whether they've inherited them or they've given them these fun names. Can you say anything about well-being and, and that side of things? I th go on. No, no, well, I was just going to say they're a focus for activity. There's something you can look at every day, you can pick over and look for insect pests, you can pick the yellow leaves off. They're an attention <coughs> grabbing thing that allows you just to step out of your daily routine and, and you know, pooter, just, you know. Yeah. Not screen based. Yeah. And I wonder if it happens to you, I think they are also a kind of thermometer of your mental status. 
when you're happy and you're kind of like connected and trying to do something, then you look after your plants. But when you're really fed up with everything, you just don't see them. You know, you are yeah. worried and your mind uh, is somewhere else. Uh, you're so scaring me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, 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 I found this quite interesting yeah. with, with any kind of um, plant or maybe if you have uh, an aquarium or something, if you realize that you are not interested into it, then mm. that's not your best day. And mm. one of the things I always try to fight back against is, and it's such a common statement, that you can't have too many plants. And that isn't true, because you can have too many plants. If you get to the point where you're looking at your plant collection and it's making you stressed because you realize there's 10 things that need repotting um, and that you know, things are failing because you just don't have the time to maintain, then you've got too many plants. And so again, I sort of counsel people to look at their existing collection, you know, do a bit of a Marie Kondo. If it's not bringing you joy, maybe find somebody else to look after that plant and retain the ones that really make you excited. And they may be different from the plants that other people uh, are enjoying. Um, and that's brings you more happiness doing it that way than feeling overwhelmed because you've just gone out and bought another 50 plants. Mm. <laughs> with, with the yucca, my, my son's got one and he wants to grow it up to the ceiling and, and across. And I keep telling him, no, um, we need to, to chop it back. So you don't need to be afraid of chopping these yuccas mm. back because they will re-sprout and um, give you a nice healthy regrowth. So uh, don't feel that you've got to let them push the plaster off the ceiling. They can be, can be tamed. Yeah. That's an interesting point too, isn't it? Because there is two things to a plant, in my opinion. One is the species and the other one is the specimen. I am always more interested in to having the species than to having the specimen, which ties a little bit with what you were saying. Like sometimes you have three plants and they are humongous and they take your own. One actually you can have maybe a hundred and they are that size. If that makes sense, so you have a hundred plants, but then they occupy a tenth of what a single plant occupies. So and I there's this amazing um, stat in your book, I think it's towards the end, about how, uh, what percentage of the population will be urbanized in, I think it's like 2040 or 2050 yes, maybe. Uh, yes. And it's, it staggered me when I read it, that it's, it's like a massive proportion mm. of people will be living in urban environments. So what do you think, obviously houseplants maybe will then be one of the only sort of connections to nature accessible to I fear that could be the case and if we don't get urban planning sorted out with access to public parks etc little oases like that will be our our vehicle to sanity um, yeah. because we're just going to be in such crowded conditions and yeah. I was going to say that it's interesting too because basically most of us is going to be living in a town but actually about half of the planet is now being cultivated or, or constructed mm. so there is no space for these plants in the wild either wild so it's a double gain isn't it like you can benefit from having plants in the house and also you can provide a place for them to grow now what's this one uh the famous spider pants speedy speedy spidey yeah i must say most of my spider plants just constant babies everywhere i'm constantly repotting but it's nice this is a it's all uh, people forget it's actually a type of lily and it, there's different species, mostly from South and Eastern Africa. There's lots of different um, chlorophytums, and some of them have got the most wonderful um, yellow and orange flowers. So um, if you look at the range of chlorophytums in, in Kenya and Tanzania, so I think there's some really potentially interesting breeding that could be mm. done to have them as a flowering plant. And they, you'll find almost like a bulb underneath them where they go dormant and, and, and dry off. And there's a, there's a super new... Um, chlorophytum hybrid doing the rounds. Um, I've forgotten its name with the orange leaves. I know what you mean, and I can't yeah. think yeah. what it's anyway. called either. <laughs> My mind's gone blank too. Anyway, we'll all we'll, we'll remember it as we walk out this evening. But uh, is breeding something people could do at home if we have any like amateur breeders, or do you need a lab and you need all oh. this equipment? It's something you could sort of, as a hobbyist, you could turn your hand at. There's a lot of great house plants being bred by hobbyists. Yes. Mm. And I would really encourage you, if there's a plant you love, mm. play with it. See mm. whether you can uh, generate new cultivars from seed. Uh, it, it may not make you millions, but it will give you a huge amount of satisfaction and fun. Mm. And African violets are one. Um, I know a, a, an amateur breeder of um, Streptocarpus 
Begonias, too, no? Sorry? Begonias. And begonias, yes. A lot of people breed begonias. Mm. So, um, yeah, it, it's certainly something you could... Breeding is not just... Plant breeding is not just for the professional. It's something that... Uh, we should all have some uh, fun. Yeah, that's exciting because I feel like a lot of people, it's sort of just trying to prevent your plant from dying. But this idea of creating something new, yeah. that's a whole different sort of angle on it, which is actually really interesting. It's nice. And there's so many houseplants also, if you don't want to go quite as far as breeding, you, know, you can grow a lot of houseplants from seed. And every year on my yes. podcast, we do a seed sowing project. And you, know, you can grow everything from the Swiss cheese plant, Monstra Deliciosa, to Streptocarpus, to... Uh, lots of cacti and succulents, mm. and they're actually quite easy to grow from seed and fun. You end up with lots of plants. You can choose the best for yourself and give the rest away, which is delightful. So, And, and little seedling cacti are like little gummy bears. <laughs> they're really <laughs> cute, the little seedlings. Yeah. Oh, okay, weeping fig. This yeah. is nice. Yeah, Wally the weeping fig, another inherited um, plant. Oh, a housewarming gift from 30 years ago. Fantastic. So that's really Great. nice. They carry memories as well, obviously. Mm. We get them as gifts. And it's grown to seven foot tall. Amazing. And what do you guys think about these apps? There's lots of these apps now, aren't there, to help you breed. Are you more instinctive? Do you just sort of look at your plants, attend to them, and they're giving you the signals to what they need? Or do you have these apps and it's everything beeps and notifies you? I think if you find them a useful tool, some, some apps can be useful, and there's apps for absolutely everything from plant identification to recording information about your plant or detecting problems. If it's going to make you spend more time looking at your plant, mm. then it's good. But don't take that as your only source of information. I mean, I guess I'm old school. I love looking at old house plant yeah. books. Well, I, um, and, and, you know, you can use a, a so many different resources. So that could be one part of your sort of tools, I think. There is that side of it that I don't like, which is actually the fun is figuring out that. Yes. For me, if that makes sense. Mm. And I hope we don't get into an Alexa, what are my plants? Yeah. You know, yeah. kind of a scenario. I think mm -hmm. it's nice to have things automated, like for example, light or perhaps eventually watering when you go away. But I will be very stressed now if I have a, You're not really a message now telling me there is this plant and it's dying, you have to get home, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I, I think part of the fun of it is working it out, yeah. you know? Yes, it absolutely. Is in, like, uh, why is growing more now? Is this because there is more light? Is this because I water it less? Is this because I put fertilizer? And then that is a very important plant, part of, of it. And I had a Swiss mm. cheese plant that um, it said it should be in like a bright, moist environment. So I put it in the bathroom and it just really wasn't happy. And I think in, in the end it went outside on a windowsill, just in a pot. And then suddenly this very long vine came dangling down and, and one leaf came out. So then I moved it into a completely different part of my house on like the mantelpiece, which was relatively dry and dusty and not, you know, not humid at all. And it's thriving there, even though the care instructions said bright, humid. So Never sometimes trust the plastic label. Okay. Never yeah. I mean, oftentimes the plastic label just says foliage plant, which <laughs> I mean, uh, and, and I've come yeah, across yeah. plastic labels where it's yeah, a cactus yeah, yeah. and it yeah, says, yeah, yeah. you know, cactus. Can thr or throw away after flowering. <laughs> <laughs> another one. <laughs> I mean, ri that's you know, to get you so to buy another one. Yeah. yeah, that's the deal. Yes. No, don't don't believe what's written on the, <laughs> the label. And also, you know, the best house parts like the Swiss cheese plant are just incredibly tough yes. and incredibly adaptable. Mm. That's why they make good house plants, mm. as opposed to something that is going to just have very, very specific needs. And so, yeah, it will cope with all kinds of things. Yeah. It's quite interesting because it says in a humid place, you know, yeah, well, at, at a home, humid will be 50% humidity, oh, but in Kew Gardens will be 95. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So this is Bucania, the Bucania. ponytail palm from Mexico. This is actually, um, uh, I think this is Recuvata, and that's yes. highly endangered in the wild. Ah. Um, but all of our stock that you buy in garden centers in this country come from propagation from the Far East or Canary Islands. Yes. But it, 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 this is as tough as it gets. This is yes. a real old boots plant. It takes even a bit of frost too. Yes, it does, surprising. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only problem with this plant as a house plant is that the base of these bulbs it has in the base, the, 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 in the wild, they are like right this big mm -hmm. and they go up five meters. So you are always tied by a space. But still, it has a good house plant, especially yeah. if you have a sunny spot. And these, these cordisiform 
fat or fat plants, as mm. they're often called now, are kind of one a very trendy yes. thing. And that there's a whole group of these plants which are very, very popular. You need to be a little bit careful, not really with this, but with no. some of the cordyciform plants that are coming um, onto the market where there are issues to do with where they're coming from. Exactly, are they yes. being taken from habitat? Because yeah. as you can imagine, if you've got a large um, cordex plant, um, how long does that take to actually grow in a nursery? Quite a long time. Um, so we do need to be a bit aware of where our plants are coming from, particularly with these new trends for particular types of plants, um, yeah. because That's we can unwittingly be, be fueling a plants being taken from their habitat. Which is yeah, that's a very point. important point to make, isn't it? Because uh, you could be participating in criminal activity, yeah. so to speak, but also you can risk criminalizing the plant growers, which I think we should not do either. Like, for example, this monstera, which was worth 500 pounds uh, per cutting, that is a totally, it doesn't exist in the wild, you know, it's a sport that has, created in, has been created in cultivation, and then because there is high demand, they have high prices. But for example, um, many other cacti, which traditionally they have been collected in the wild, they are now grown by seed. In fact, many mm. like the Echinocatus grusoni, it doesn't even exist in the wild anymore. No, it's gone. Yeah, mm. it's a mm. tiny so population. So there is plenty of plants that you can grow knowing that it's not going to be collected, where there is other groups of plants that you should be really careful. So is there something people can look out for, like an equivalent of fair trade? for plants <laughs> to, or is it just a kind of I wish it was that yes. straightforward yeah. unfortunately yeah. Yeah. Or go to a good supplier yeah I mean you ask, ask questions yeah. ask questions mm. about yeah. where plants are coming from basically my, my advice will be the minute it gets into the expensive side then try to check out where it is being mm. produced if that makes sense it could be expensive yes because you know has to be shipped from a nursery in the Netherlands and it comes in a hundred kilos pot or it could be as expensive because it's ripped off from the wild and then smuggled into the country. Um, nobody and it's, it's also worth joining plant societies if you get really into a particular kind of plant, like a cact cacti, for example, or aroids. Join a plant society and ask questions of the experts there mm -hmm. and ask those people, well, you know, what's the conservation status of this plant? Where can I buy it responsibly? And that way, you'll, you'll enhance your own knowledge, support those plant societies, and also that means that you're hopefully finding some good answers about those kind of questions as well. Yeah. Go to the shows and quiz the, uh, the nurseries at the, at, at the specialist shows. I think Carlos is right. There's a lot of the stuff that we're buying as houseplants are bulk produced by yes. the tens of thousands, and there's, they're not from the wild, but as you go into that s little bit more expensive collector's area, and there are still collectors out there who want the wild collected orchid, the wild collected cactus, the wild collected pachypodium, and they will pay good money for that, bad money. And that's where you can quite often um, unwittingly purchase uh, something that's been wild collected. Mm. So it's something, something to watch for, and always ask if you're, you're in doubt. Um, there are a few paradoxes out there too, like, the, you know, Bucephalandra, this uh, kind of plant that grows in rivers and that can be grown out of the water. And ten years ago, there was only one species, then suddenly it, it becomes a trend. So people was starting to rip them off from the wild, but then they start selling them under very strange names that nobody could work out. And then suddenly one of the experts start looking at it and as a result of the plant trade, Something like 60 species were identified that we didn't know mm. that there was because nobody cares about these plants until this thing happened. Yeah. And interestingly, three of them were already extinct and only survived because they were poached before somebody chopped the forest. So that's, really? that's the internet trade, isn't it? That's, yes. Um, whereas I think your garden center trade is probably very well regulated. But once you go into the wild west of buying oh, yeah, specialist yeah, yeah. plants on the on the internet, you're then going into a different world and you do need to be very careful there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder if we have any questions from the audience. Um, yeah, if you raise your hand and wait for a mic. And I think Jane and Carlos are particularly good at the care, perhaps, side of yeah, things. Yeah, I'm going to step aside. <laughs> and Mike, yeah. maybe yeah. more about the history. <laughs> um, any particular? We've also got some more images, I think. So some nice yeah. orchids there. I mean, I always, whenever I sort of do a houseplant talk, I'm always very disappointed 
if somebody doesn't ask me a question about how to get their Phalaenopsis orchid ah. to reflower? Because <laughs> that is the number one number question. One, is somebody yeah, yeah. going to ask that question? Anyone want to know the answer to that question? I can yeah, tell you. Is it that one out of the way? Yeah, well, yeah well, I mean, uh, the, the, the going back to my previous point about toughness of plants, Phalaenopsis, particularly as a result of all this breeding that's gone on, um, has now become this mass plant that is everywhere. And they are very well suited to our homes. They like the, the they don't, they don't re not really bothered about hugely high humidity and they can cope with the temperature in our homes. So they're very, very tolerant um, and they flower for a very long time. Uh, oh. And they will reflower and the advice always used to be, well, you need to get a temper different temperature differential between day and night yeah. in order to spark them into flowering again. I'm not sure how much that's true anymore because there's been so much breeding that I don't necessarily think that always is the key. Uh, but the main thing with, with Phalaenopsis is just make sure they're getting enough light and that you are keeping them healthy. And once that flower stem has stopped the flowers have dropped off. You can either cut it back to the base or you can cut it back to a node, which is a kind of a scaly point on that stem. And if you do that, you may get some extra flowers coming off that existing flower stem. If you cut it to the base, it takes a bit longer, but you get more flowers as a result. Um, do you need to feed them? Well, they then their nutrient needs are quite small. I mean, they're another, uh, yet another epiphytic plant. Mm, yes. Um, so their nutrient needs considering the incredible flowers they produce, are actually quite small. Yeah. But if you are going to feed orchids, then do use specialist feed. Don't just give them um, a leafy houseplant feed because they, on the whole, it's easier just to use orchid feed. Yeah, um, or, or use normal feed, but at a much lower and a rate. Yeah, or just reduce, like but yeah, yeah, exactly. So orchids are wonderful and, uh, and easy, so. I try to enjoy the leaves in between the flowers. The leaves, I know they're not very exciting, but I like the leaves. Personally. I have a question. Um, can anyone remember their first house plant? And was it particularly significant? Was it this sort of oh eureka gosh. moment? Or was it a disaster? Or was no it way. something that really got you into botanicals? What? In my case, when I was born, my mother had two flower shops. So I don't remember ah. at what point on the mount of floristry ways I regain consciousness, yeah. you know, uh, like so it was always around they you. were always around there. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I, yes, and similarly, I had plants from a very young age and used to go to jumble sales and pick up cacti and be given plants. I do, and I, but I do remember at quite a young age, there was a big, in my sort of open plan 70s doctor surgery near my home was a big Swiss cheese plant. And I remember sitting, waiting to see the doctor and just looking at this plant and just going, wow, <laughs> what are all those roots for? Because, you know, yeah, a yeah. big, a big uh, monstera will have a lot of aerial roots. Um, you never see this on Instagram, but, you know, it's a spaghetti monster. It's covered yeah. in these. And I remember thinking, what are they for? And I'm, one of my earliest sort of houseplant memories is thinking about that plant and wondering what all those roots were for. Um, and I just, yeah, I've always, always had plants, really. So I, I know that lots of people have this moment when they perhaps get their own first home when they suddenly discover plants. But for me, it's kind of been in my, in my veins forever, I think. Mm. What about you? Yeah, same here. The, the moment that gave me the click, um, I was given a packet of Sutton's mixed cactus seeds for Christmas. Ah. <laughs> and so there was the whole anticipation of waiting for the, for the spring to sow them because we only had a very small heated uh, seed box in the greenhouse and then watching these little green jelly babies sort of germinate and grow. And um, there was one of these rat-tailed cactus that survived and grew, and I had that for probably about 10 years afterwards. That, that, was a, that would be a, a, a clinching moment. Amazing. <laughs> Is it cactus or cacti? I've always wondered that one because I never quite know how to say it. Is that, I suppose that's the Latin thing, no? Plural cacti. Plural cacti, yeah. okay. Yeah, I always want to check Cactuses that. Cactuses doesn't. Cactuses doesn't sound <laughs> strange. Yeah, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Yeah. But one of the things people often sort of get very worried about with plants is pronunciation of scientific ah, yes. names. And 
I, was, I love scientific names, but I always say it doesn't really matter. If you go into a room with people, plant people from different parts of the world, you'll be talking about the same plant, yeah. so using the scientific name, and everybody will be pronouncing it yeah. differently. Mm. Is it Clivia or Clivia? Does it really matter? No. Clivia. You Clivia. know, <laughs> you know, you know, I mean... Uh, Clivia is not allowed it. Okay, you, well, I'm going to... Uh, a lot of yeah, Americans have told me absolutely firmly that it's Clivia. I've always said Clivia, but anyway. Um, you, don't worry about sounding silly because there's no Romans around to tell you how <laughs> Latin is pronounced yes. anymore. No, no, so but don't worry about the it. The, but the E thing is a very English thing to do, isn't it? The I with the, like I pomoia, for example. Mm -hmm. or, but then you don't say I in patience. You say in patience. It's all very confusing. It's all very confusing. It makes <laughs> no <laughs> sense. But don't worry it about it. Just, it's just, it's just no, dive no. in there and yeah. try. It's, it's, this is the good thing of social media. <laughs> you just spell it and then everybody read it, whatever they, they like. Don't know what <laughs> how it sounds. Exactly, exactly. There's also all these amazing kind of folk names or, you know, like uh, what's a silver ragwort, but then it was called like the Dusty Miller was another name for it. All these amazing images that come from the past, perhaps yes. when it wasn't Latin or, mm. you know, it wasn't so scientific. And they're really great images, which are quite amazing, poetic in many ways. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, there's some amazing common names. And there's, annoyingly, there are some common names that are applied to dozens of different houseplants, like yes. money plant, yeah, yeah. like okay. bridal veil. I mean, mm. bridal veil is about five different plants. Yes. Uh, and so that's why the scientific Latin is useful, because that narrows it down and yeah. you actually know what you're talking about. But there, you're right, there are some brilliant common names. And do you think that taps into, because people talk a lot about plant blindness, don't they? That we, yeah. we see, you know, to us a bush is just one big mass, whereas actually there may be multiple species in there. And perhaps to some of our ancestors who were more in tune with nature, they might have had more knowledge of the individuals there. And we've sort of lost that over time, which kind of speaks to what you were saying about the money tree being this broad term. Do, what do you guys think about that? It's uh, Something perhaps you may not experience because you're more expert, but plant blindness is um, evident at very different levels. So at, at, at the highest level of conservation planning and uh, policy, you've got plant blindness mm -hmm. um, because everyone's focused on on, on on the mammals and the birds and the reptiles. And then when people talk about wildlife, I always say. Um, you including plants and wildlife, or are you excluding plants mm -hmm. and wildlife? And, no, and there's a different answers. And then there's the ability for us to read a plant. And folk who've got house plants are actually able to read a plant. Mm -hmm. And they can assess when it's drought, droughty or about to flower or coming into a new, new growth phase. And that's reading a plant, and that's combating plant blindness. So I like I that that's a very a valuable plant. thing. There is all these areas also which are very interesting, isn't it? Like uh, if plants can have feelings or if plants mm. can feel common, pain. Yes. And it's, it's, it's very funny because, uh, for example, um, plants cannot have feelings, but I can tell you that this plant is very happy. <laughs> if that makes sense, so if it doesn't have a feeling, why is it happy? Mm. Mm. Um, but then it's interesting the scale they operate, you know? They look like totally inanimate objects mm -hmm. so then we don't even consider them to be alive somehow mm -hmm. but then if you if you has have house plants you realize the scale of time how it was passing and how they are actually ha they have a plan which is maybe getting into the toilet through the shelf towards the window and then now you cannot use your sink uh, or the slow motion footage of when yeah. you see and they're actually constantly yeah, waving yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. dancing yes. almost yeah. and you see and that yeah. then and it's it's very interesting you know there is this case of this plant from chile I don't remember now the name, it's a, it's, a, it's a climber. And it shocked everybody when it was realized that when it grows into a shrub, the leaves mimic the shape and the color of that shrub. But then when it grows over the next one, it changes. Boom. Ah, so like then a chameleon. Most, uh, yeah. But most scientists then start thinking that perhaps it's because that plant can detect the chemicals of this plant, and then it has a software which enables it to then mimic the plants of the environment until somebody went and did the experiment with an artificial plastic plant. And guess what? It changed to the shape of the plastic plant, which is one of those croton-like fake plants. Oh, that wow. First of all, it's not a plant, and second, yeah. it doesn't <laughs> live in so the habitat. So it could habitat. almost see somehow. So then it opens the way for, for plants being able to, to see if you kind of imagine what it will mean seeing without eyes. 
Eh, and even though the, pay, the paper has been published, most scientists I saw it, they go like, I don't believe that. Eh, because it's, it's such a, it will be such a kind of, wow. Crazy idea eh, for us. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. because that, um, in my, in my view, it's also, we have like a semantic problem with this, you know? Like if I say now that plants think, uh, you, you know, you will put me a straight jacket and then <laughs> get me out. But then if I ask, you know, define thinking, mm. what are you going to say? <laughs> you, if, if that makes sense. And yeah. For me, thinking is analyzing data, processing it, and then take a decision based on that, and clearly plans with it, and they do well, it they're all the clearly time. intelligent. And yes. I really take comfort in the fact that I don't think they're too intelligent because they're sharing my house. <laughs> and <laughs> they I'm might take over. And I'm just happy that they're there as... They're not commenting. It's a bit little shop judging. of horrors. Yeah, they're not um, sort of having a conversation when I'm not in the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just assume they're, they're nice, passive. There was this thing as well I read, though, during lockdown when everybody was at home, apparently the plants were hap well, happier because there was more vibrations or there was music and there was company. And then when everybody went back to their offices, the plants seemed to be... Well, I don't know if that was scientific or... Well, I can tell you that from the scientific point of view, you will be putting more CO2 into the room because you are there breathing and that will make them grow happier. Ah, okay. Because so it's just a chemical I, thing, I, even. Yeah, I grow and, and going back to the point about observation, yeah, so well, yeah, you were there, yeah, weren't you? Yeah, you were there yeah, observing yeah, yeah, your yeah, plant. Yeah, yeah. You no, spotted when it was wilting. But <laughs> it, is, it is true. I mean, like, um, it, the, the plant will grow faster if it has higher concentrations of CO2. It, uh, I notice I have an aquarium with corals, and if I go away, they grow faster because I don't breathe CO2, and then that doesn't acidify the water, so then that means that they can put more calcium. I will be surprised at your CO2, even though you are not going to purify and detoxify your house and produce oxygen enough to, to make your hamster breed happier, it is true that your CO2 is going to make them happier. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we've just reached half past, so thanks so much for that conversation. We had a few more images, actually. I wonder if we could just click through them. So this um, one's great. Some excellent names here. The Never Never Plant named by Felicia. <laughs> <laughs> Ivy called June. The Dragon Tree is Sideshow Bob. That's a really fantastic one. Again, so um, anthropomorphized, but obviously a deep connection with them. And there's some lovely ones there on the window ledge. That was 12 pounds. <coughs> ah, now this is uh, the famous Dolly from our office who was um, <laughs> named after Dolly Parton because we did an event with her. Um, so that's a nice place to end. Um, but yes, thanks so much to our panel tonight for this. It's been a great conversation. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, Mike's got his books available in the bookshop and we'll be doing a signing afterwards if you'd like to buy a copy. And Jane and Carlos, I believe both have books out uh, if we search online. Is that correct? My book's not out till next April. Okay. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So watch this space for Jane. <laughs> oh, was on 2018, I think. Okay. Yeah. You should read it. It's great. Okay, amazing. Cool. So there we go. So some um, links to check out after the event. But yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. Um, yeah, and hope good luck with all the houseplants. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.